Hey, what's up? Today, I'm gonna try and convince you guys to make your own chili crisp from scratch. Not because you can't go buy good tasting chili crisp at the store, but because making it is fun and the results are not just good, they're truly great. To get started, we need to fry up the crispy part of this chili crisp. But if you can't or won't fry things at home, later in this video, I'm gonna give you a cheater version of this recipe with store-bought crispies. First things first, I'll grab two or three large shallots and about 15 cloves of garlic. To prep them for the crisp, I'm gonna on a double layer of kitchen gloves, then hit the garlic on my Japanese mandolin. Mandolins are controversial because literally everyone who has ever used one eventually cuts themselves really bad. But in my opinion, it's the fastest and most effective way to slice things thinly and uniformly, which is exactly what we need when we're trying to crisp up garlic and shallots. Of course, you could definitely use a knife, but I would only recommend that if you have an intermediate level competence and you have a really sharp knife. Basically, even slices are very important here because uneven slices will fry unevenly and give us a combination of soggy garlic and bitter burnt garlic. The key to using a mandolin is to use it safely. And for me, that's years of experience, but for you, that could be a double layer of nitro gloves or a cut glove. Okay, once I've got 75 grams of evenly sliced garlic, I'll grab my shallots and then shave those on the mandolin as well. With larger, taller stuff like this shallot, never point your fingers directly at the blade. Keep them in a claw shape instead so that only your knuckles are exposed. This also keeps downward pressure on the veggie at all times, which makes it a lot more stable on the mandolin and enables us to get much more uniform slices. The thickness of these shallots should be about a 16th of an inch, and in total, I need 200 grams. Okay, once I've got my garlic and shallot sliced up, I'm gonna grab a three to four quart pot and drop it on the stove. Into that, I'll add 700 grams of peanut oil. I wouldn't recommend olive oil for this because it's a mono unsaturated fat, meaning that it's solid at fridge temperature and you have to melt it before you could use it. Okay, once this oil is heated up to about 300 F, it's time to fry. I'll start with my garlic slices first by just dropping them into the oil carefully to avoid splashing. Then I'll come back with a slotted spoon or a spider to mix things up. I wanna make sure the garlic chips are getting differentiated early because once they start cooking, they get sticky and they'll clump up if you don't agitate. Now I'm gonna fry these over medium low heat for about two and a half minutes or until they've taken on a really light golden blonde color like this. From here, I'm gonna quickly lift these out of the oil and move them over to a paper towel to drain off any excessive oil. I wanna mention that you should should pull your garlic chips before they look done. If they look perfectly golden brown in the oil, they're gonna carry over cook to be burnt and extremely bitter. Okay, oil is back up to 300 F, so next I'll carefully drop in my shallots to avoid any splashing. Then just like I did for the garlic, I'm gonna immediately agitate so I can separate the rings quickly. Once these things are loosened up, I'm gonna fry for another five to six minutes over medium low heat, stirring every minute or so. At the five minute mark, these onions are turning light golden brown and look pretty dehydrated, so I'm gonna lift them out of the oil and move them over to the paper towel with the garlic. You can go darker with the shallots than with the garlic because they don't get bitter when they take on browning. If you're wondering if you can sub onion for shallot here, I would say no. Onions are too sweet and too wet and they just end up oily and soggy, not crispy. Next, I'll grab a couple knobs of unpeeled ginger or about 75 to 100 grams worth and slice it very rustically into large coins. This ginger isn't going directly into the crisp, so shape doesn't matter at all. From here, I'm gonna move back over to my oil which I've crept up to about 325 F and I'll carefully drop in my sliced ginger and fry for three to five minutes. At this point, the oil is already deeply flavored with shallot and garlic, but now I wanna infuse it with some more pungent flavors that bring some much needed mystery to the final chili crisp. Once the ginger's had a minute or two to bloom, I'm gonna add in two cinnamon sticks and five to six pods of star anise. Then I'll fry for three to five more minutes to really get this oil infused. The star anise and the cinnamon bring a mellow warmth that reminds you of Chinese five spice. It's so sick. While that stuff fries, I'm gonna grab a medium bowl and add in 60 grams of Korean gochugaru chili powder. But Bri, Chili Crisp is Chinese, not Korean. Well, I chose gochugaru because it has a ton of intense fruity chili flavor while being relatively mild on the Scoville heat scale. It's somewhere around 2000 to 8000, which makes it similar to a jalapeno. I also chose to use it because it's widely available at almost all international grocery stores. And more importantly, it has a coarse flakiness 
to it. It's not actually a powder. This makes it resistant to burning in the oil, which creates instant bitterness and will ruin the fruitiness of the chili crisp. I tried grinding a wide variety of my own chilies from scratch, but that experience was labor intensive, not in a fun way, and it led to chili crisps that were extremely spicy and inconsistent. If you can't find gochugaro, I would say sub 30 grams of standard issue chili flakes and 30 grams of paprika. Just really keep an eye on the oil so the paprika doesn't burn. Back at the stove, my ginger is starting to brown and the spices are letting off a beautiful mm. pungent aroma. So from here, I'm gonna very carefully move my oil pot over to the gochugaru and pour it over the chili powder through a strainer to catch the ginger and spices. Now I'm gonna let this 300 to 325 F oil bloom the gochugaru to make a super intense chili oil. Real quick, I just wanna mention that the majority, if not all of the chili crisp recipes that I researched to develop mine only infuse the chilies into oil one time. And I think this leaves a ton of flavor on the table. Adding this extra infusion step before we fold in all of the crispy stuff essentially doubles the fruity chili flavor. And using gochugaru here instead of a spicier chili gives us the density of chili flavor that we want without excessive heat. After a five minute infusion, I'm gonna pour this chili oil through a strainer to remove the spent gochugaru, making sure to press with the spoon to get as much of that flavorful oil pushed out as I can. Now the pot goes back over low heat to bring the oil up to 325 F, while I think made in for making this dope three quart saucier and for sponsoring this video. If you haven't heard of made in, they make professional quality products, but for the home cook. In fact, their products are so pro that Chef Grant Ackett's at Chicago's three Michelin starred Alinea uses them and Chef Eric Repair uses Made In at his famous New York restaurant, La Bernadette. I've only ever worked in one star Michelin kitchens, but I can tell you with certainty that Made In products are actually better than what we used on the line. That's thanks to Made In's premium five ply stainless steel material. The five layers provide heat retention, super even heating, and most important for me, heat control. That means there's no hot spots and the pan transfers heat to food beautifully. My favorite pieces from the stainless collection are the three quart saucier, which I'm using to make this chili crisp, and the 12 inch stainless stainless saute. That one's great for searing meats, but I literally have every stainless piece that they make and I love them all. So if you want some pro level cookware for your home kitchen, check out the stainless collection and Maiden's other cookware by using the link in my description to get some of the best deals of the year. These pans are durable, beautiful, and go from the stove top to the oven up to 800 F. Thanks to Maiden for making sick cookware and for sponsoring this vid. Back at the same bowl, I'll add in 30 more grams of gochugaru and 30 grams of regular old chili flakes. This combination of chilies for me has the right blend of flavor, heat, form factor, and availability. Behind the chilies, I'll add in 20 grams of sesame seeds, then grab some cracked Szechuan peppercorns and sneak out just a little bit. Szechuan peppercorns, if you're not familiar, aren't spicy, but they do pack a certain kind of punch. Oh, my whole mouth kind of feels sour. sour? or, or, or uh, confused or, 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 and it my tongue and feels and like, tongue like the feels color, color purple. purple don't get me wrong this is a very delicious ingredient it brings a wonderful aroma and a really brilliant numbing quality but it's potent as hell so start with a really small amount and add more if you can't taste it and to get this prep down i broke it down from these larger peppercorns into more of a powder that way you don't get giant chunks on your tongue and totally blow out your palate for the next 20 to 30 minutes okay once these first four ingredients are in the bowl i'm going to take the oil temperature 325 looks good so next i'm going to move this pot over to the bowl and carefully pour the oil over to infuse it with chilies one more time now i'll just stir the sesame szechuan and chilies into the oil stirring obviously is going to combine things but it's also useful for cooling the oil down i don't want the chili powder sitting at 325 indefinitely because it'll overcook and get too roasty tasting after 10 minutes we've got some insanely flavorful chili oil along with a tasteful level of chili salads to bring some additional texture next i'll snatch all of my crispy shallots and garlic and crumble them into the bowl with my hands. Personally, I like a chili crisp that distributes evenly over the food that I'm saucing, so I like to break things down. But if you want something really chunky and rustic, then skip this step. Next, I'll add in 75 grams of chopped peanuts. Quick tip on those. Once they're chopped, the peanuts are going to end up sitting in a peanut dust, which tends to make the chili crisp taste overwhelmingly of peanuts. So to avoid that, I like to throw these through a fine mesh strainer and sift out all of that peanut flour. Lastly, I'll add in 35 grams of salt, 5 grams of MSG, 3 grams of fish sauce, 20 25 grams of soy sauce, then a one, two, three, four, 
five second squeezer of honey or 40 grams. From here, I'll just stir until everything is well combined. You'll notice that there's a lot of chili crisp here. That's by design. Just like homemade jam or pickles, making three or four jars is nearly the same amount of work as making one. So why not make extra and share with your friends or freeze? Yes, this chili crisp can be frozen. Just make sure you're throwing it in a vessel that allows a little bit of room for expansion. To finish, I'll drop into two pine containers and then throw in the fridge to marinate for at least one day. This chili crisp will stay good for about four to five weeks, but there's no way it's gonna last that long. To make a faster, easier version, you certainly could use store-bought crispy bits. Most international grocery stores carry some variety of pre-fried garlic and onions, and those versions are passable. The recipe is basically the same. You're gonna steep ginger and spices in oil, then pour it over gochugaru and infuse for 10 minutes. Drain off the gochugaru, reheat the oil, then pour that over gochu, chili flake, sesame seeds, and Szechuan peppercorns, and infuse for 10 more minutes. Once you've got the double infused oil, you can fold in your store-bought versions of the pre-fried shallot and garlic along with your peanuts. And that's a fast, pretty good tasting chili crisp that's better and fresher tasting than Lao Gama. Don't threaten my life though. Lao Gama is good, it's just that this is very good. Okay, back to the main character, crisp. After a two-day fridge marination, you can see this crisp looks so sick. The oil that might have looked excessive on day one has become more inky and viscous in the fridge, and now it perfectly coats all the crispies. And oh my gosh, the oil is so deeply red. It's crimson. It's scarlet. What are other words for red? Now, my absolute favorite way to eat chili crisp is just simply on rice with some chicken and some steamed vegetables, but it's good on almost all foods. I love it on a thoughtfully prepared avocado toast. I love it on an everything bagel covered in cream cheese. I love it with steamed dumplings. And of course, I love it with fried eggs. This chili crisp is perfectly spicy. It's insanely fruity. It's crunchy in three or four different ways. And there's just enough of a hint of anime cinnamon and Szechuan to keep you guessing. If you guys like this video and you want to keep having a good time, then please check out this video linked on the screen. I'll see you there.